this week on History Detectives. How did this twisted fragment of metal spark a communications revolution? It was the moonshot of the mid-19th century. Our final case investigates the strange story behind this odd piece of ocean debris. August 16, 1858. The tapping of a telegraph pad transmits an historic message. Glory to God in the highest. On earth, peace, goodwill towards men. The message spans the vast distance of the Atlantic Ocean in a matter of seconds. But while the promise of near instantaneous communication between the continents is intoxicating, that first cable is fragile and quickly failed, silencing the signal. How could 19th century engineers solve the challenges of laying a reliable cable across thousands of miles of ocean? More than a century and a half later, New Jersey native Art Johns thinks he may have discovered an important link in a chain of communications that changed the world. My family was on vacation, and I think we may have found a piece of history. I'm Tukufu Zuberi, and I'm meeting Art in his hometown of Somerset, New Jersey. Nice to meet you. Please come in. Thanks. So what do we have here? I suspect this might be a piece of one of the early transatlantic cables. OK, where did you get this thing from? We found it on Cape Cod. We were vacationing there in 1984. We came across this on Nauset Beach. So was this just sticking up out of the beach? That's just about right. It looked as if it was uh, a rubber band that had been snapped and had coiled up into a big, big kind of ball of cable. So we got a hacksaw and we cut a section out of it. We actually made a joke that as soon as we cut through the cable, all uh, communications to Europe ceased. <laughs> So, how did you think this cable got to the beach? The previous winter, a freighter had run aground in that area, and we always speculated that that ship running aground might have disturbed the cable or, or cut the cable and allowed it to coil up on the beach. Okay, what exactly is your question for me? My question is, is this one of the early transatlantic cables? Do you mind if I just sit here for a moment and check out the cable and see what I can see? Of course, I'll be in the back room. All right, thanks. all right. One thing, this is a dirty object. Luckily, I brought some gloves. This rust could have accumulated in a, a hundred years, but it may have accumulated in a few years. Maybe there's something about these concentric circles of meadow that will be informative. I mean, is this how the cable that was laid on the bottom of the Atlantic looked? I don't know. Before transatlantic cables, the United States was a much more isolated nation. When President Lincoln was assassinated, the news took 12 days to get to Britain. But the cables, which were submarine telegraph wires, made communications across the Atlantic almost instantaneous. For the first time, the waking economic giant of the United States was plugged into the news of the day and the movement of financial markets in Europe. I've tracked down some images of cross-sectioned 19th century submarine cables. Many of them are similar to Art's. However, none of them are exactly like Art's cable. I'm learning a lot about how these cables worked. They all have rings of metal bars around. They all have some kind of insulation. And they all have a copper core, which would carry the message. An engineer named Cyrus Field spearheaded the laying of the first transatlantic telegraph cable in 1858. It ran from Ireland to Newfoundland. That's more than 800 miles north of where Art found his cable. But it seems that later cables laid by different investors and engineers snaked south too. According to this map, a couple of the later cables came straight in to Cape Cod. Thank <laughs> you.
I'm traveling to Kingston, Rhode Island to meet historian John Steele Gordon, who has written a book about the lane of the first transatlantic cables. This is a piece of cable. It certainly looks like a 19th century submarine cable. You can see armoring, and then this is tarred hemp on the outside here. Okay. The hemp coating protected the concentric metal rings, or armor, from rust and decay. That armor, in turn, protected the copper transmission wire. John explains that protecting and strengthening the early cable was a priority. The first cable, laid in 1858, failed after only a few weeks of operation. I just happened to have a piece of the first one with me. Wow. It was very badly designed, okay. and they tried to push too much electricity down it, and they blew it up. It only worked for two weeks. It didn't work very well for two weeks. We have a complete transcript of everything transmitted over the 1858 cable, and almost all of it essentially is, what? <laughs> Despite the technical failure, John explains that the first transatlantic cable set the popular imagination on fire. This was a big deal. It was the moonshot of the mid-19th century. The idea of being able to communicate instantly with Europe was just electrifying to the time. Give you an idea of how big a deal it was, um, there's a fresco in the Capitol Dome, which was decorated in the late 1860s, and it shows Neptune and Venus carrying the Atlantic cable across the ocean. Well, that's something to look for the next time I'm looking at that dome. John says that the later cables were much more robustly designed, thicker and better armored. Would those cables have looked like this one? They would look very much like that, yes. Okay. But by the end of the 19th century, there was a cat's cradle of cables all over the world. John tells me transatlantic cables were big business, both for the investors laying the cable and for the turn-of-the-century economy as a whole. It allowed New York and London markets to operate together. And Wall Street loved the Atlantic cable. How did they actually get this stuff in the water? Well, they would coil the cable hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles onto a ship in these great big drums. They would just dig out the whole middle of the ship, essentially, and then they would feed it off the end with cable-laying machinery. I asked John if there's any way to prove that this is one of those historic cables. Well, one thing that's very distinctive about 19th century submarine cables is a substance called gutta percha. Gutta percha? Gutta percha was a natural plastic. It came from a tree in Southeast Asia, and up until the 20th century, that's what they used for insulation of the message-bearing wires in the middle of the cable. So to determine if my cable was actually from the 19th century, I would need to know that it has gutta percha in it. Yep, and if you identify it as gutta percha, then it's certainly a, a 19th century submarine cable. Thank you very much. I'm heading to the University of Rhode Island, where I've arranged to conduct a test on art section of cable. I'm meeting Professor Chris Brown in the University Spectroscopy Lab. How you doing? I see you brought your uh, artifact with you. I did. Chris explains that he needs to take a small sample from one of the rings of insulation in order to conduct a comparative analysis. Gutta percha was once used for everything from golf balls to walking sticks. The only use of gutta percha today is for filling root canals. All right. So we obtained a sample of the gutta percha from a dentist office. Chris shows me the unique chemical makeup of the dental gutta percha. We're going to compare your unknown with this standard. Chris explains that this machine, a spectrometer, consists of a diamond probe. When pressure is exerted on the probe, infrared radiation is introduced. The spectral fingerprint is a measurement of the degree to which certain wavelengths of infrared light are absorbed by the sample. So this is the fingerprint from my cable? Exactly. The next part of this is to compare fingerprints. On the top, we have your sample. On the bottom, we have the dental sample. And how do you translate this? We can see that every peak in the gutta percha appears in your unknown sample. It's a perfect match. So I have gutta percha in my submarine exactly. cable. Exactly. 